Welcome to today's Bible study with Pastor Josh Tice. The next time you're in Las Vegas, we'd love to meet you in person at Southern Hills. If you happen to watch us regularly, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and consider sharing this video with a friend. You can support the ministries of Southern Hills by visiting southernhillslv.com and clicking the Give tab. Now, sit back, relax, and get ready to learn how the Bible is relevant in your life today. You made it back to church. Give yourself a round of applause. You did it. You're here. You found your way back to Southern Hills, and I'm glad you're here. We're going to have a great time as we study the Word of God together. Last Sunday, we began a brand new sermon series entitled Glow. Do you have that card? There it is. And we talked about this specific concept, that you are in the midst of a, a battle between good and evil, light versus darkness. There's a battle raging not only for this world, but for your very soul. And last Sunday, we began with a sermon entitled Ignite. And we talked about how to ignite the power of God in your life through prayer specifically. We talked about how God himself, through Jesus Christ, taught us how to pray. Now, I want to do a little interesting beginning here. Start out the sermon a little different. By having a little participation from the audience, I want to hear from you. How many of you remember last week we talked about prayer, and I said there are three words that you need to know from Luke chapter 11 to really understand prayer. Those three words summarize all of Jesus' teaching in Luke 11 about prayer. What were those three words? Does anybody remember the, the very first word of those three words? If you do, uh, shout it out. What was that first word? Father. There were a lot of you who knew. How many of you knew that? Give you, raise your hand. Wow, there's a lot of you who remember that. You're a great audience. I'm impressed. The first one was father. Does anybody remember the second word? What was the second word? Shout it out. Shameless, Shameless right? So if we're going to pray, we need to view God, not ritualistically, we're to view God relationally. We're to see God as having a relationship with us. And not only father, shameless tells us we're to pursue God in a daily way, in a constant way, in a never ending way, shamelessly going to our father, asking for our needs. And then the third word that we said summarizes prayer was what? Ask. 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 Yeah, the prayer itself literally means just to ask your father shamelessly for what you need. And if you're new to the church, you say, wow, is that what last Sunday? You heard all of last Sunday. And so you didn't even have to come. This is great, right? You summarized right here. And then when we talked about prayer at the very end, the sermon ended with a twist. If you remember, Jesus ends his teaching with a twist ending where he says, you can ask for whatever you will and, and he will give. And you, you think he's going to say he'll give you whatever you need, but he doesn't. He says instead, if you ask God for anything, he will give you. What does he say he's going to give you? Does anybody remember? The Holy Spirit. We said that the Holy Spirit is the one thing that you can pray for that includes all the things that you actually need for your life. The one thing that includes all the things. So let me ask you this question. How many of you prayed for the Holy Spirit? Okay, a lot of us. A lot of us heard last week's sermon. We said, okay, we need to pray for the Holy Spirit. Either you prayed for it last week or you prayed for it at some point of your life. I want to find out again. How many of you at least one time has asked God at some point in your life, Holy Spirit of God, fill me, control me. I'm asking God for the Holy Spirit. How many of you ever prayed that? Raise your hand. How many of you prayed that? Okay. So if you did it last week, how many of you, you prayed it, but your life did not change dramatically since then? So, Pastor, you said, pray for the Holy Spirit. It's the one thing that has all the things. And then I prayed for it, and my life is the same. So, like, what happened? And that's what Luke chapter 11 and the very next few verses teach us. We're going to see that the Holy Spirit of God, when we pray for him, is a spark that ignites inside of us. And there's a flicker of a flame that arises. And that begins a battle for your soul, Jesus versus Satan, good versus evil, light versus darkness. And that flame in and of itself can be symbolized with the symbolization of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the flame. The flame is the Holy Spirit. 
You say, what do you mean? All throughout the Bible, there is an image of God as a flame. We, we see the image when Abraham has a, a covenant with God and they split aside the carcass and God walks through the covenantal process. And the Bible says he walks through. Do you remember how he walks through? The Bible says he walks through as a flaming fire. Interesting. Moses, later on in the book of Exodus, the Bible says is out there in the middle of the desert and all of a sudden he sees up on a hillside uh, smoke coming and he walks over to the smoke and he sees a burning bush, a flame, a fire representing God himself speaking to Moses. Interesting. And then when he leads the children of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land, do you remember uh, during the day it was a, a pillar of cloud and at night they followed God as a pillar of fire. The Holy Spirit represented there as the flaming fire. We see it also in the rest of the Old Testament. We see it when Elijah is on the top of Mount Carmel and he's fighting against the prophets of Baal. And he calls out to God and says, God, to prove that you are the one and only true God, send fire down and consume this sacrifice. And God descends as a flame of fire. We see it later on when Israel disobeys God and the Babylonian empire is sent in to capture all the young men and they take away Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and they're thrown into the midst of the Babylonian captivity. And then three of those young men decided they would not bow before that idol. And when they didn't bow before that idol, the Nebuchadnezzar, king Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to throw you into a fiery furnace. And sure enough, they were thrown into the fiery furnace, but they were not alone. The Bible says there was a fourth one in the flame with them that was like the Son of God. So we see this imagery of the Holy Spirit all throughout the Old Testament. And then we arrive in the New Testament. There's a crazy man. His name is John, John the Baptist. All Baptists are the crazy man, right? <laughs> and this crazy man, John the Baptist, is out there and he's baptizing people and he's baptizing them in water. And everybody's like, you're amazing, John the Baptist. You're baptizing people in water. And he says, no, I'm not the amazing one. There's going to come one after me who baptizes people not in water, but in the Holy Spirit and, Matthew chapter 3, fire the Holy Spirit. I'm really glad that worked. <laughs> and then Jesus dies upon the cross. He's buried. He rises from the grave. And after he dies and is buried and he rises from the grave, he ascends up to the Father. And then he tells his disciples, stay here because I'm going to send him unto you. Who did Jesus send to the disciples? And do you remember how it took place in Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost? The Bible says all of the disciples were in there singing and praying together. And all of a sudden the wind hit the door and a rushing wind comes in. And then a flame of fire does what? Did you just put an extinguisher? <laughs> did they just, did, they, did you all... Just put a fire extinguisher up here. Wow. How many of you are nervous about flames and you're like, thank God for AJ. Amen. <laughs> Several of you. And what happened? The flaming Holy Spirit comes in and what does he do? <laughs> he represents himself there as the flame of fire. Now, the problem that we have in relationship to the Holy Spirit is that as he is the third person of the Godhead that we are to have a personal relationship with, is that though we are a God, God, our God is a flaming fire, as the word of God says in the book of Hebrews, the problem is sometimes it's so very easy to quench the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. In fact, that's what Paul says to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, be careful that you do not quench the Holy Spirit of God. Because though the Holy Spirit of God is a gift to the church, and though the Holy Spirit of God is a gift to you personally, and though you can pray for the Holy Spirit of God to fill you, just as Jesus said, pray for the Holy Spirit and God will give you the Holy Spirit. 
Though the Holy Spirit of God comes in and dwells with you the moment of salvation and can control you and lead you on a daily basis, though this is all true, it is also equally true that it is very easy and very dangerous to quench the Holy Spirit of God in our lives, to smother his influence in our lives. Today's sermon is designed for one purpose, and that is to explain to you from Luke chapter number, oh, thank you very much, from Luke chapter number 11, how exactly it is that we as Christians are to keep from quenching the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. You want the power of God in your daily life? You want to understand how he can continue to bring you love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and goodness and faith and self-control? You want those elements in your life on a daily basis? Then what you've got to do is keep from quenching the Holy Spirit of God in your life. As I said before, you are in the midst of a battle and you may not even know it. There is a battle between good and evil raging over your soul on a daily basis. And the only way you're going to overcome in this battle, the only way Jesus wins and Satan loses, the only way the angels win and the demons lose, the only way you can lean into light and resist the darkness is if the power of the Holy Spirit of God is living in you and through you. What you must not do is quench the Holy Spirit of God in your life. And in Luke chapter 11, we get an explanation of how that takes place. Today, four ways that Christians quench the Holy Spirit in their life. Look what it says. Number one, the first way in which we easily quench the Holy Spirit of God, number one, is that we easily and quickly dismiss Jesus. Do you know what I find? There are not a lot of people that will deny that Jesus existed. And there's not a lot of people who will deny that Jesus is important. They don't deny Jesus did great things. They just dismiss him as irrelevant in their lives. And that's what takes place in Luke chapter 11, verse 14. It says, and he was casting out a demon and it was mute. So it was that the demon had gone out, that the mute began to speak, and the multitudes were amazed. Remember the context. Anytime you're studying the Bible, you must understand the context of the passage itself. The passage begins by Jesus teaching us to pray. And he wants you to pray relationally to the Father. He wants you to pray shamelessly to the Father. And he wants you to pray just asking God for what? The Holy Spirit. Now, when the Holy Spirit of God comes, now, as he's dealing with this light versus darkness, he tells a story, or the writer tells us a story about Jesus meeting a demon-possessed person, light versus darkness. And as Jesus, the light, meets the darkness of this demon-possessed person, this demon-possessed person is healed, and all of the multitude is amazed. They're all celebrating. They're all marveling, the Bible says. However, there were some in the groups that were a little bit cynical, a little skeptical, a little dismissive of Jesus. Look at what it says in the very next verse. In the next verse, it says in verse 15, but some of them said, yes, he casts out demons, but he does so by the, by the power of demons. He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of of demons. So this was their argument. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus can heal people and Jesus can cast out demons, but he does so by the power of Satan. It's very easy to dismiss Jesus when you don't want to just straight up deny Jesus. There are a lot of people that cannot deny. In fact, these people were not fans of Jesus. They could not deny he was doing great things. So they just quickly dismissed. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's He's doing great things, but how he does those things, I'm not sure I agree with. Do you find that true with, with people in your life? They, they don't deny Jesus. They just dismiss him as irrelevant, non-important. He's a non-essential worker in their lives on a daily basis. And I find this to be true not only of unbelievers. If we're not careful, as Christians, we do exactly the same thing. What we do is we say, well, we know there's a Holy Spirit in our lives. We know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are essential. But is he really important for my life today? And we don't deny him. We just dismiss him. We ignore him. Here's the problem. 
is that we as Christians need to remember that our Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is an actual person. And a person is not to be ignored. A person is not to be easily dismissed. A person is not to be put aside. And if you're not careful, you're going to fall into the same trap that a lot of people do. And that is this, that in reality, though the Holy Spirit is present in their life, they dismiss him as irrelevant for their daily life. If I were to tell you, you are not allowed to eat for the next 15 days, many of you would say, how long? <laughs> if I were to tell you, you're not allowed to eat for the next seven days, some of you would be like, thank God I don't have to make a turkey, amen? <laughs> but if I were to tell you, you could not eat for the next three days, some of you would be like, even that's a long time. But if I were to tell you, you could not have the Holy Spirit for the next 15, the next seven, the next three. Honestly, there are a lot of Christians that would just keep on living their lives as they've always lived them. They would not even notice his absence. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is more essential to your daily life than your daily bread. He is essential. But the way we snuff him out, the way we smother him, is the same way they do. They don't just deny that he exists. They just dismiss him as irrelevant. Number two, the second thing we see in this passage is one way we quench the spirit of God and let Satan win. Number one is we quickly dismiss Jesus. Number two, we argue with Jesus. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever been guilty of arguing with God? Like God's trying to get through to you on a specific point and you try to fight him a little bit on it. Have you ever, have you ever argued with God? I, I know that that's definitely something that happens. Uh, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a reality check. It, it's not a good idea to argue with Jesus. And there's, there's a few reasons why. Because Jesus doesn't easily lose arguments. He's a very good debater. How many of you are like me? You love to debate. How many of you are like me? You love to hear yourself talk. And you love to make sure that people know your opinion. You love to make sure that you're going to get through. Let me, let me be fairly clear about this. If you're like me and you love to argue and debate, whether it be online or in person, here's the problem. Sometimes you take that same personality trait and you try to bring it to God. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to not wrestle some things with God. That's totally appropriate. As long as you know, you're going to lose every time. Ask Jacob. Jacob one day was walking by a river in the middle of the night. And as he walked by the river, he met God himself. And the Bible says he didn't really recognize him. So he's like, let's fight. That's the kind of guy Jacob was. That's the kind of guy some of you are. Some of us are. Is that we see something, we're like, let's fight. And the Bible says he's wrestling with God. But in the middle of the night, they wrestled for a long time. What did Jacob do? The Bible says God reached over, touched Jacob's thigh, put it out of joint, and Jacob spent the rest of his life limping. <laughs> Why? Because you don't wrestle and argue with God and win. That's just the way it works. And so it is here. So if you remember in the context of the story, what happened? They look at Jesus and they say, yeah, you're casting out demons by the power of demons. And they begin an argument with Jesus. Look what happens. Look what happens. He argues with them and Jesus gives three solid arguments that totally blow away their argument. Number one, he says, your accusation is totally irrational. That's his first point. His first argument to these people that he's using the devil to cast out the devil, he says, number one, your argument is, your accusation is irrational. Look at verses 17 and 18. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, casting out demons by demons? Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Civil war. What nation do you know that has a civil war and can still continue to function in a continual state of war. Eventually, a, a nation that continually fights itself will be divided and destroyed. The same is true of families. Look at what Jesus says. A house divided against itself will fall. Feuding families. You go into a home and the family is constantly fighting against itself, constantly angry. Eventually, the family is going to fall apart. Then he goes on to verse 18. If Satan also is divided against himself... How will his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. Jesus says your, your, your argument 
is totally and completely irrational. If Satan was casting out Satan, his kingdom would fall apart. So Jesus, number one, says your argument, your accusation is irrational. Number two, your accusation is self-incriminating. Jesus is a good arguer. Look what he says in verse 19. If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. You see, this community had their own little um, exorcists who would go around and they would perform their little exorcisms. And so Jesus' point is, look, hey, I've got to ask a question. If I'm casting out demons by demons, who are your demon-possessed people casting out demons by? The answer is, look, your argument against me is not only irrational, it's self-incriminating. And number three, your argument and accusation proves how powerful I actually am. He gives three great arguments. Look at his third argument. His third argument is if I'm casting out demons by the power of Satan, it shows how powerful I actually am because I'm using the power of God. Look at verse 20. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, he says, suppose I'm actually from God and I'm casting out demons by the power of God. Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Then he gives a illustration. He says, all right. Suppose a strong man fully armed, guards his own palace. His goods are in peace. But when a stranger that is stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes him from all his, takes all of his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. Jesus said, let me explain what's going on here. Um, imagine there's a giant castle and there's a big guard out front with all of his armor and he's protecting everything he has. He says, then there's a stronger guy with a bigger army, and he comes in, he takes that guy, he beats him up, he takes all his armor, goes in, and he takes the whole castle. Jesus said, you want to know what I am? I'm the stronger guy. Demons are guarding the hearts of these people. And I come in, I take that demon, I break him in half, I walk inside, and now I own the human soul. That's who I am. Your argument has shown how powerful I actually am. So what, is, what do we learn from this? Well, we learn that Jesus is powerful, but the second thing I learned is don't argue with Jesus. Don't, don't fight him. Are you, an, are you an arguer? I should say it this way. Are you married? <laughs> Any married people in the room? Raise your hand. Married people? Okay, it's me too. I'm married. I've been, we've been married for 21 or 79 years, something. We've been married a long time. And, Heather and I have been married a long, 21 years, and we recently had an argument, you know. <laughs> Happens occasionally, you know, once every Thursday, you know. <laughs> it's all the time. Some of you are not going to like this story because you like to think of your pastor on a pedestal as never having sinned. Uh, you're going to be very offended with this story. <laughs> we, had a, we had an argument, um, I don't know, it was just really recently, last night, and... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. It was at least a week ago. And we, um, it, was, it was a bad argument. It really was. Like, it's never, it's only a few times it's gotten so bad that I storm out of the house. You ever do this? You know, you're, you're like highly dramatic, like your pastor. You're like, that's it. I'm leaving. And so uh, this, this has only happened a few times in our marriage, uh, two that I can specifically remember. Uh, and one was just, you know, like literally like a couple weeks ago. And... Um, and, and it happened late at night. We had already argued, and she was done arguing, so she went to bed. I was not done arguing. And so I wanted to keep it going, you know what I mean? And she's like, she's just asleep. She's fine. She's at peace. And I'm like, I'm, I'm laying in bed. Have you ever just laid in bed and you're just, oh, I'm so <laughs> Try to roll over really hard, you know? Finally, I'm done. I'm done. I'm like, I'm out of here. Like, I was so angry. I genuinely, I was really upset. So I got up. And I, and I did not make any small, quiet moment of it. I made a big deal. I'm, I'm getting up. and I'm getting dressed. And, and I, I leave the house. And I shut the door. A garage door opens up. And I pull out. And I'm leaving. You say, where are you going to go? I have no idea. <laughs> That, that's the problem. When you're a follower of Jesus and the people around you that are closest to you, they're also followers of Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, who are you going to call? What am I going to do? Call Trevor and be like, Trevor, I'm having a fight with my wife. He'd be like, go back home to your wife. <laughs> what are you doing? 
Like, that's what would happen, right? So I'm like, I'm, I'm just angry, you know. I'm just really frustrated. And I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to just go get a room. I'm going to go down to the place and, and find a little hotel room and just, and just really soak there. For, and then I had a really evil thought from the devil. Really, I had a thought. I'm going to turn off my notifications and I'm going to turn off my Find My Friends app so she can't see me. That's what I thought. I'm like, oh, man. And then I got her, t she started texting me. Hey, are you awake? Hey, where are you? Hey, what's going on? And I ignored it and I ignored it. And then she started calling. I'm driving on Blue Diamond Road. She's calling. And I ignored the call. Ignored the call. I'm just still. And the farther I went, I didn't calm down. The more enraged I got. And I knew exactly where I was going, and I was going to get a room, and I was going to let soak it in for the night. I was going to sit there and just be angry. And then, as much as she tried to call, it wasn't getting through. But then, the Holy Spirit of God touched my heart. And with very clear message, the Holy Spirit said, you do not ignore that call. You answer that call. Have you ever been in a situation you did not realize was as dangerous, but God knew it was dangerous? He said, you answer that call. And I got to tell you, I'm not a perfect person, but I've lived long enough to know don't argue with the Holy Spirit. So as soon as I, I don't want to answer the call, you answer that call. Picked it up. Hello? Hey, where are you? What are you doing? Is everything Okay. No, I'm mad. And so you know what happened? We argued some more. <laughs> and she stopped it. She, she stopped it. She said, look, look, I don't want to argue. I just want to make sure you're okay. Come home. You can sleep in the bedroom. I'll sleep on the couch. That, that sounds like a great thing for a man to do to his wife, right? <laughs> and I said, sounds good to me. <laughs> she said, I'm not kidding, Josh. You come home. This is dangerous. It's not good for us. We need to talk this out. I was not in the mood to talk it out. I did not want to go home. I wanted to run. But it was not the arguing of Heather that convinced me. It was the fact that the Holy Spirit of God was very clear. Go home, go home, go home. This is dangerous. Go home. So I went home. And we argued <laughs> late into the evening. And then we hugged each other. We fell asleep. And then we have gotten back together. Yay. <laughs> Everybody's like, ooh, thank God. I didn't know where that story ended. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Are you such a stubborn person that the God of heaven is trying to get through to you and you keep putting him on hold? Like he's been speaking to you about a sin in your life and you're like, I do what I want. Why are you arguing against the Holy Spirit? Or he wants you to start something in your life and you keep pushing against the Holy Spirit. Or he wants you to stop something in your life and you keep pushing against the Holy Spirit. Or he wants you to give something in your life and you keep pushing against the Holy Spirit. And here's what you don't realize you're doing. What you're doing, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, is you are slowly suffocating the voice of God in your life. You are quenching the power of God in your life. The God that wants to give you a daily portion of love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and self-control, all of these things can be yours because if you get the one thing, you get all the things and the Holy Spirit is the one who brings them. But you don't have it because you've been quenching Him. And that's what happens with these people. You're casting out demons, but by the power of demons, they keep arguing with Jesus. Which leads to our third way that we often quench the spirit of God and let Satan win. Yes, we dismiss Jesus. We argue with Jesus. Number three, we attempt to reform ourselves. This third way is one of the most interesting one of the ways in which you and I end up pushing away God is that we attempt to reform ourselves rather than seeking revival from the Holy Spirit. 
What do I mean by that? You would think that a person like you would come to a place like this and a guy like me would tell you, all you need to do is reform yourself. All you need to do is have more recovery. All you need to do is, is try harder, work harder to reform yourself. But look what the Bible says in verse 23 through 28. Jesus goes on and he makes a very clear point. Remember, everybody's out there. He's speaking to a large audience and he says, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Now stop right there. Notice in the middle of Jesus' sermon, he says, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather scatters. That is an amazing thought. Jesus basically said, if you're not with me, you're against me. There's, there's no neutrality with Jesus. You might be thinking to yourself, well, I'm not, I'm not really a Jesus person, but I'm not against Jesus. No, you're against Jesus. You say, I, I, I don't hate Jesus, but I don't necessarily love Jesus. No, you're not on his side. There's no neutrality with Jesus. Some gather, some scatter. If you're not with Christ, by default, you're against Christ. See, I just don't even believe. You're not believing in Christ means that you are against him. That's what he's saying. If you don't make a choice, you say, I'm just going to think about it for a while. You not making a choice is a choice. You say, well, I can either receive Jesus or I can reject Jesus. I'm definitely not going to reject Jesus, but I'm, don't, don't think I'm going to receive him. You not receiving Jesus is rejecting Jesus. You chose a side. Say, that's a very dogmatic way to think. Well, that's exactly what Jesus says. So I guess you're saying Jesus is very dogmatic. So either you're with the guy who is dogmatic or you're not. You're with him or you're against him. Now, after he makes this very uninclusive statement, he says, verse 24, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man. Now, somebody might be thinking, I'm not with Jesus and I don't need the Holy Spirit, but I'll, I'll, I'll clean up. Oh, thank you very much. Is my voice starting to go? Okay. <laughs> this is the woman. Can you give her a round of applause? She's pretty, pretty good. I like her. She stayed with me. All right. Thank you. That actually is much better. Thank you very much. Look what it says in verse 24. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes out through dry places. Jesus is going to talk about what it's like for a demon-possessed person to lose a demon. Now, you've seen the movies, right? You've seen a movie where a human is demon-possessed, and then the demon goes, and then what happens in the movie is you follow the story of the human. Jesus is going to tell you what happens to the demon. Look what it says. When an unclean demon goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest, finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. Here's what a demon does. When an exorcist comes in and ki kicks out a demon, the demon leaves. He goes around in dry places and a demon doesn't like to be without a host. So as he's out there, he comes back. He thinks, why am I out here? I need to go back to the house from which I came. And the demon who was cast out comes back to the individual, and look what it says. When he comes, he finds the house swept and put in order. And he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first state of the man. Jesus said, you want to understand battle of light versus darkness, good versus evil, demons versus angels? He said, this is the way a lot of people are. They have demons, and then they cast out their demons. And that's what some of you have been trying to do. You're trying to cast out your demons. You're trying to clean up your act. So you have a special exorcist come in and get rid of the demon, and then you have maybe a special seance or a prayer ceremony, get rid of the demons, or maybe you just go to church more. And maybe you just go to church more, and you're just going to turn your life around, and you get rid of this demon and that demon. And the problem is you're still empty inside. And so the demons go out and they do whatever they do. And then they come back. And because the demons have not been with you for a while, your house is, your heart is all straightened up, decent and in order, cleaned up, dusted. It looks really good. And the demons come in and they're like, hey, this looks good in here. It's like a rock band who's thrashed the hotel. They leave and the maids clean it up. They come back. They're like, we can thrash it again. That's what's going on. And then the demons come back and they see it nice and clean and in order and they bring with them, hey, seven more demons. I found somebody. He's empty. Let's go. 
and the end of the man is worse than the first. This is what reform is versus revival, meaning religious people think to themselves, all I got to do is clean up my act and get rid of the demons, and then I'll be okay. No, friend, you don't need to get rid of the demons. You don't need to get rid of the evil spirits. You need to bring the Holy Spirit to beat up those demons, fill yourself with the Holy Spirit's presence daily. You need to seek the power of the Holy Spirit. You, you need a professional. I was at coffee on Friday morning early um, with, uh, with Peter Schutzman, who's one of our deacons, and um, a guy named Gabriel Ponce. He's newer to the church. Great guy. And, and we were getting to know him. I didn't know what Gabriel did, does for a living. I said, Gabriel, what do you, what do, you do? He says, oh, I'm at the Bellagio. I, I work in the engineering department. I said, oh, cool. What does that mean? He says, basically, we go around and kind of, you know, maintain and fix and do a lot of stuff. He said, but I come from granite. I'm like, granite? He said, yeah, I, I spent 20 years doing granite. And I looked at him and I said, I don't take that for granite. Because <laughs> of the joke? He, it wasn't funny then either, so. <laughs> anyway, um, I said, so granite, really? He said, yeah, yeah, I do, I, I, I repair granite. I said, that's fascinating because my wife and I, our granite in our countertop literally just like, like has cracked from our sink. The, the water got in somehow because I didn't seal it correctly. And then the, the metal expands and then goes back and contract. And so there's this huge crack in the middle of our granite. I'm like, I thought I was going to have to replace the whole thing. He said, no, you don't have to replace it. What you have to do, and he talked about this specific type of poxy that you can get that actually fixes the whole thing. And I'm sitting there with Peter and, and, and Gabriel. And as we're talking, he said, yeah. And then Peter's like, oh yeah, all you have to do and this and that. I'm like, that's awesome. I said, can I like just pick that up at Ace Hardware? And Peter looked at me, and he, Peter knows me well. He said, Pastor, no, no. You do not go and pick that up at Ace Hardware and try to fix your own granite. I said, what do I do? He said, you call a professional. <laughs> he said, because if you try to do it, you're going to make it worse. You're fighting a battle for your soul and you think it's an, a DIY project. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Some of you genuinely think I'll just get rid of this demon and that demon and this problem and that problem. I'm just going to be better. Well, you've been trying it for a very long time. How's it going? You need a professional. And when I say professional, I'm not talking about a guy that is up here teaching or a guy with a big collar around his neck. I'm talking about the fact that the Holy Spirit of God is the only one who can truly permanently excise all of these demons from your life. But instead of trusting the Holy Spirit, we insult him by saying to the Holy Spirit, I don't need you. I got this. In fact, some of us think we're doing some sort of a great feat by saying, don't worry about this, God. You take care of others. I'll take care of me. I'll get rid of my sins. And what you're doing is you're suffocating the Holy Spirit of God in your life. You're putting it out. And the flame of the fire of the Holy Spirit no longer rages inside of you because what you do instead is attempt to reform and what you attempt to do is, is you reform, but then you relapse, and then you reform, and then you relapse, and then you reform, and then you relapse, and then you reform, and then you relapse. And what you need is the power of the Holy Spirit to do what you can't do. These are the ways we quench the Holy Spirit in our lives. We dismiss Him. We argue with Him. We attempt to reform rather than seek revival. And lastly, and we'll be done, we talk about it. And we talk it, but we don't walk it. We love to talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. And this is exemplified in verses 27 and 28 in the middle of Jesus' speech, in the middle of his sermon. Somebody gets really excited and shouts out something 
and it's really weird. Remember the picture? Jesus is talking about prayer, and then he demon-possessed guy leaves, and then, he, um, then he's teaching about demon possession, and he's preaching like I am, and all of a sudden, uh, this person in the back, this woman gets really excited, and she shouts out something because she's really excited, in the, but it, it gets really weird. He, she says some weird stuff. Are you guys ready to hear what she says? Like, look, this is, it's kind of funny, actually. Look at what he says. And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised up her voice and said unto him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. (laughs) And then like, can you imagine? Like, here we are in a church service and all of a sudden if I'm preaching and somebody got really excited about the sermon, they stand up and they're like, pastor. And I'm like, please don't. And they're like, blessed is the womb. They bore you. Don't go any further. And the, don't stop. (laughs) Nobody needs this imagery. You say, well, pastor, maybe it wasn't so weird back then, the different culture. No, it was weird then too. It's a weird thing to interrupt a speech with. But I love how Jesus deals with it. He doesn't rebuke her. He's just a great teacher and public speaker as well. And he doesn't rebuke her. Look at what he does instead. Uh, he, he said, uh, more, more than that, it's almost like Jesus is like, thank you so much. Also, and he changes the subject really quick. I love it. I love it. But Jesus said to him, more than that, said to her, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. She ultimately was saying, blessed is Mary for giving birth to you. And Jesus says, thanks, but actually you're more blessed than the Virgin Mary is because you hear the word of God and obey the word of God. It sure is a whole lot easier to be like this woman who gets excited about a good sermon and says, that's awesome, and then goes out and doesn't do anything about it than to be the type of person who hears the sermon and then changes their life based upon the word of God. I I love this church for so many reasons. And one of the reasons I love this church, and don't stop, I love this church because you're an extremely validating church. You're very loving, you're very kind. You'll you'll come to me almost every Sunday like, Pastor, that was a great sermon. (laughs) You'll text me, what a tremendous sermon. That was a great sermon. And I'm always like, I'm not gonna pretend I'm above it. I'm like, thank you very much. I am a wonderful speaker of the word of God. (laughs) It's nice. It's nice. Thank you. But here's the fact. It's so much easier to say to the pastor, that was an amazing sermon, and then completely forget everything that was said five minutes after you walk out. And you know what that does? When all you can do is talk it, but you don't walk it, it quenches the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Hey, mother, grandmother, don't be somebody who's always talking about Jesus, but you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Hey, Christian, don't be that guy at work who's always telling people about Jesus, but the fact is you ignore the Holy Spirit every single day. Don't be the Christian who comes to church and talks about how much God means to you, but you can't remember what the Word of God said to you, said to you, said to you. Friend, This is how we maintain a consistent, continual, true, flickering, fiery flame in our hearts. We ignite it through prayer, and then we allow the Spirit of God to rage in our hearts as He consumes us, as Hebrews chapter 10 says that the Holy Spirit is, a consuming fire. Let Him consume you, because otherwise... Otherwise, we're putting out the only flame that can truly make a difference. It's a battle for your soul. Good versus evil. Light versus darkness. Demons versus, versus angels. Jesus versus Satan. And it's up to you whether or not you allow the Holy Spirit to flame inside. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Wow, it impacts our hearts so highly, so deeply. And my prayer is that every single one of us in this room would not only acknowledge the reality of the beauty of these words, but would not just hear them, but would do them. Oh God, keep us from quenching the Holy Spirit. Please, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching Josh Tice's most recent Bible sermon. 
If you think of someone who may enjoy this one, go ahead and send it or post it today. If you're ever in Las Vegas on Sunday, we'd love for you to stop by Southern Hills and see us in person. If you benefit from this virtual ministry, we'd also like to encourage you to support our gospel efforts by sending a donation to the ministries of Southern Hills. You can do so by visiting southernhillslv.com and clicking the Give tab.